we'd like to welcome to the stage Vietnamese artist and activist Mai Khoi, accompanied by Mark Michele, to kick off tonight's event with her original composition, Lan In. là bạn thân của tôi giờ là an ninh của tôi người bán thông tin của tôi dù dê bạn bè xa liệt tôi từng là rất thân của nhau từng chia cho nhau yêu thương từng sớt cho nhau niềm đau u ê bộn bề trong từng câu cho rằng tôi u mê hoang đường và cho rằng tôi là mối nguy hại cho những ai còn đang gặp tôi tránh xa tôi ra người nói tránh xa tôi ra nếu không muốn thân tàn mà làm chú cùa nhỏ ngoan 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 chưa bao giờ muốn phản kháng khi chứng kiến chuyện trái ngang chưa bao giờ em tự hỏi mình đang đúng hay đang sai sau những lần làm bạn bè ái ngại em cũng chẳng còn thiết chia ai vì cuộc đời không còn quá dài sao em cứ giả vờ đóng kịch mãi sao em cứ hoài lại nhãi sao em cứ giả vờ đóng kịch mãi don't tell me how to live my life don't tell me what is wrong or right Don't tell me, don't tell me anything. You better stop giving me advice. Đừng bao giờ khuyên tôi phải sống cuộc đời như em. Đừng bao giờ bắt tôi phải sống cuộc đời nhà hèn. Đừng bao giờ khuyên tôi phải thành công như em. Sống lập lờ, sống mơ hờ, tiến thân trên những cơ hội là những thứ tôi chưa quen. Thank you very much. Mark Michele. Let's hear it again for Mai Khoi and Mark Michele. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Closing Night, the final event of the 2022 Penn World Voices Festival. My name is Summer Lopez, and I'm the Senior Director of Free Expression Programs at PEN America. We are an organization whose mission it is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate the power of the written word and champion the freedom to write. This is our 18th PEN World Voices Festival, and since 2005, the festival has stayed true to its original mission, to celebrate the power of storytelling and literature in translation, and to convene global voices across borders, language, and culture. Tonight's event, An Evening of Forbidden Books, is presented in collaboration with PEN America's Children's and Young Adult Book Committee and our Free Expression and Education Program. And special thanks to our bookstore partner, The Strand Bookstore. This is, of course, an all-too-timely event, taking place as it does against the backdrop of alarming and dramatic escalation of book bans in school classrooms and libraries across the United States, and particularly of attempts to target books by and about people of color and LGBTQ plus people. As PEN America documented in a re report we released last month, Banned in the USA, over the nine months from July 2021 to March 2022, there were 1,586 instances of books banned in school districts across the US. 
That represents bans on books by 874 different authors, 198 illustrators, and nine translators. Across the globe, book bans are a weapon of authoritarianism, from apartheid South Africa to Putin's Russia. Autocrats ban books and repress writers because they know books are indeed dangerous. They offer hope in darkness and a vision of what is possible. Yesterday, we hosted an emergency Congress of Writers with over 70 writers from around the world gathered at the United Nations to discuss the many crises facing humanity today. One theme that emerged was childhood, how it can be shaped by trauma, but also the potential for change that lies in those who are still free from the biases and dogmas that our societies will be quick to instill. The discussion made even more clear to me why book bans are so particularly pernicious, especially when they bar children's access to books. At their core, they are an attempt to restrict young people's exposure to the multiplicity of ideas, perspectives, people, and stories that make up our complex world and that make it possible to forge a pluralistic democratic society. Thus, it is essential and urgent that we speak out and fight back against book bans and that we continue to read and speak the words that some feel should be forbidden. That's why I'm especially glad we are here tonight, both in defiance of these persistent attempts to silence writers and books, and in celebration of the stories that challenge, inspire, and move us. So thank you all for being here and being part of this truly star-studded celebration of the freedom to write, read, and think, featuring dramatic readings from some of the most dangerous texts ever printed. We are delighted to welcome tonight's lineup, Wajahat Ali, Susan Cooklin, Tochi Onyabuchi, Tanya Talega, Paul Zielinski, Molly Crabapple, Eileen Miles, and Fatima Sheikh. Jason Reynolds was unable to be with us today, but he recorded something very special for us. And unfortunately, V was also unable to join us, but she asked her friend, Marissa Tomei, to share her remarks with you tonight. I'm especially pleased to introduce our wonderful MC for tonight, Wajahat Ali. As a New York Times contributing op-ed writer and public speaker, Waj has shown us just how vital each thread of the fabric of American identity is to its integrity. And he's funny, too. The son of Pakistani immigrants, Wajahat wrote the heartbreakingly funny memoir, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on how to become an American, as, quote, a love letter to a country that doesn't love us back. He thoughtfully advocates for the rights of marginalized people everywhere to speak their minds. Let's give a very warm welcome to Wajahat Ali. Thank you, Summer, for that awesome introduction. I will sign your check and put it in the mail. Or The kids use Venmo, right? I'll Venmo it to you. Uh, good evening, New York City. How you all doing? All right, listen. I'm going to quote the late Bernie Mac. I'm not here for any foolishness. They're stripping away our constitutionally protected rights. They are banning our books. They are silencing our voices. The one way, historically, we have always fought back is by telling our stories and being loud to show the world that we are alive. So when I ask you how you are doing, I want a vibrant live response. New York City, how are you doing tonight? That's right. As a son of immigrant parents, I'll say, not bad, not bad, could be better. This is America. And if you aren't telling your story, your story is being told to you by others. And if you aren't writing your story, your story will be written for you by others. In 2022, America, some parents are more comfortable with their kids getting COVID at school than reading a story written by a black author. To quote the talking heads, same as it ever was. Thank you. All right, the talking heads fan there, that's fine. You could clap, don't be ashamed, it's a safe space. I was born and raised in America in the year of 1980 the son of Pakistani Muslim immigrants, and I never read my people's story in the school textbooks. I never saw us as heroes on the big screen or glanced upon our beautiful brown faces on the billboards. Nope. We were at best sidekicks, stereotypes, punchlines, villains, or worst of all, completely excised from the American story. And to quote public enemy, Marissa, thank you, I saw that. We had to bum rush the show just to be seen. A question though I often ask myself, is it better to be the villain or to be invisible? 
because at least the villain gets some great lines and a speaking part. Even though I'm American, every single day I get very helpful unsolicited recommendations in my inbox that tell me to go back to where I came from. And I always say, great, the Bay Area, California, I'd love to if you could subsidize my rent. And like, shut up, Gandhi. Or I get told, you know, do you want me to go back to Pakistan or pre-partition India? Or are we going Freudian and am I, go am I supposed to go back to my mother's womb? When I usually respond, I get another unhelpful recommendation that tells me to go fuck a goat or a camel. And then I always ask, why only goats and camels? Why limit my options? Two legs good, four legs good. But I digress. It's always fun being a writer of color in America. Every day is an adventure. And I'm sure you've heard that we're living in a moment. Who here has heard that? We're living in a moment in America. Yeah, in a moment. We've been in, living in a moment for 400 years. A heightened moment where even talking about diversity, equity, and inclusivity can get you fired if you're a public school teacher. Florida, by the way, just passed the nation's first law restricting how race is discussed in the workplace to make sure that some people don't feel discomfort. And also, this falls up on the Stop Woke Act. Can't make it up. It's actually called the Stop Woke Act, which is banning CRT that is not being taught in schools. And now we're banning books by Toni Morrison, we're banning Handmaid's Tale, and we're banning Mouse because some people don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable. And now you can't say gay in Florida. Don't say gay because some people may, might feel uncomfortable. And I'm going to do a deep cut. This is an 80s pop culture reference. I'm just going to test this out. I feel like gay is like Beetlejuice. If you say it three times, magically gays appear. Well, I want to test it out. <laughs> gay, gay, gay. Any gays? Are there any gays? Any gays? One gay. There's one gay. Two gays. Two gays. Can I have three gays? Three gays. There's three gays. That's half. That's three and a half gays? Let's take it. It works. If you say gay three times, they magically appear. We're living in interesting times where you can't say gay to make some people feel uncomfortable, yet gay kids are still being beat up and bullied. Black people are being shot and killed by the police. Women don't have equal pay. Anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hate is on the rise. And now there's a spike in anti-Asian hate crime because bigots are so stupid they think COVID has an ethnicity. But we must always, the real victims must always kneel to the economic anxiety of the average American. We engage in all sorts of fantastic Cirque du Soleil gymnastics, undemocratic measures, and now we ban books just to avoid talking about our country's awesome and ridiculous history of racism, double standards, and inequities. But the question I have is how do you get to reconciliation without truth? The same people who champion such restrictive actions need to maintain fictional stories and myths about this country called America because these stories are comfortable, convenient, and although they are constricting, it helps their tribe stay in power and feel good even if it comes at the expense of truth, equality, fairness, accountability, justice, and the expense of our stories. But telling the real story apparently is not worth the immense economic anxiety. Instead, we're now banning books. But tonight, we're going to show you all that the short-term anxiety and reading and celebrating these dangerous, was it dangerous summer? You said dangerous books? Dangerous books, let me do it in my movie phone voice. Dangerous books is actually worth it. In the long run, these dangerous books, thank you for that, I love it are the necessary medicine this country needs to heal itself even though it doesn't want it. And the only way to stretch this country and to move it forward is to expand it so everyone has a chance to become a co-protagonist of the evolving American narrative. 40 years ago, PEN America held an event like this one. 40 years ago. It too was called An Evening of Forbidden Books. That event, 40 years ago, celebrated books that made people uncomfortable, dangerous books, that offered new ways to live, new realities, new ideas. 40 years ago, celebrities, writers, activists, and prominent New Yorkers read excerpts from such dangerous works, such as The Wizard of Oz, can't make this shit up, and Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice that were banned for some ridiculous reason or another. And sadly, 40 years later, not much has changed. There have been 11,300 books that have been banned since 1982. And check this stat out. In the past year, between July 2021 and March 2022, 
1,145 books have been banned. Tonight, though, we have poets, playwrights, activists, and novelists ready to share our stories and perform a little magic with the word. But first off, we have an actress. Uh, this is an up-and-coming actress. Uh, you will be hearing a lot from her. She has a lot of talent, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of talent. I think she's going to go the distance. Her name is Marissa T T Tomei. Marissa Tomei. Award-winning actress, Academy Award, two Golden Globe Awards, three SAG Awards. She advocates for social justice and equal rights. Marissa Tomei. Thank you for welcoming me. V is very sad that she can't be here, and she told me it was okay to let you know that she caught the Rona, but that she's feeling okay, but she, obviously she couldn't come. So she chose um, a section from I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, Maya Angelou. It's uh, chapter 12. His legs were squeezing my waist. Pull down your drawers. I hesitated for two reasons. He was holding me too tight to move. And I was sure that any minute my mother or Bailey or the Green Hornet would bust in the door and they would save me. We were just playing before. He released me enough to snatch down my bloomers and then he dragged me closer to him, turning the radio up loud, too, too loud. He said, if you scream, I'm gonna kill you. And if you tell, I'm gonna kill Bailey. I could tell he meant what he said. I couldn't understand why he wanted to kill my brother. Neither of us had done anything to him. And then, then there was the pain. A breaking and entering when even the senses are torn apart. The act of rape on an eight-year-old body is a matter of the needle giving because the camel can't. The child gives because the body can and the mind of the violator cannot. I thought I had died. I woke up in a white-walled world, and it had to be heaven, but Mr. Freeman was there, and he was washing me. His hands shook but he held me upright in the tub and he washed my legs. I, I, I didn't mean to hurt you, Reedy. I didn't mean it. But don't you tell. Remember, don't you tell a soul. I felt cool and, and very clean and just a little tired. No, sir, Mr. Freeman, I won't tell. I, w I was somewhere uh, just above everything. It's just, I'm just so tired, and I'll just go lay down a while, please. I whispered to him. I, I thought if I spoke out loud, he might become frightened and hurt me again. He dried me and handed me my bloomers. Put these on and go to the library. Your mama ought to be coming home soon, so you just act natural. Walking down the street, I felt the wet on my pants, and my hips seemed to be just coming out of their sockets. I couldn't sit long on the hard seats in the library. They had been constructed for children. So I, I walked by the empty lot where Bailey was playing ball, but he wasn't there. I stood for a while and, and I watched the big boys tear around the dusty diamond and then, then I headed home. 
after two blocks. I knew. I never make it. Mm -mm. Not unless I counted every step and I stepped on every crack. I had started to burn between my legs more than the time I'd wa wasted Sloan's liniment on myself. So my legs throbbed, or rather the insides of my, my thighs throbbed with the same force that Mr. Freeman's heart had beaten. Thrum, step, thrum, step, step on the crack, thrum, step. I went up the stairs, wanted, wanted up, one at a time. No one was in the living room. So I went straight to bed. After hiding my red and yellow stained drawers under the mattress. When mother came in, she said, well, young lady, I believe this is the first time I've seen you go to bed without being told. You must be sick. I wasn't sick, but the pit of my stomach was on fire. How could I tell her that? Bailey came in later and he asked me what the matter was. There was nothing to tell him. When mother called us to eat, I said I wasn't hungry. She laid her cool hand on my forehead and my cheeks. Oh, maybe it's the measles. They said they're going around the neighborhood. And then she, she took my temperature. She said, you have a little fever. You probably just caught them. Mr. Freeman took up the whole doorway. Then Bailey ought not to be in there with her unless you want a house full of sick children. So she answered over her shoulder, he may as well have them now as later, get them over with. She brushed by Mr. Freeman as if he were made of cotton. Come on, Junior. Get some cool towels and wipe your sister's face. As Bailey left the room, Mr. Freeman advanced to the bed. He leaned over, his whole face a threat that could have smothered me. And again, so softly I almost didn't hear it, if you tell. I couldn't summon up the energy to answer him. He had to know I wasn't going to tell anything. So Bailey came in with the towels, and Mr. Freeman walked out. And these are the remarks that V asked me to share on her behalf. I read this book, that chapter, when I was around 16 years old. The staggering description of the rape of eight-year-old Reedy was a seminal moment in my life. The image of Reedy's bloody panties at her mother's feet is engraved in my consciousness. Even though at that young age I was, I was still too terrified and unprepared to open the Pandora's box to my own memories of childhood sexual abuse, that passage let me know that what I unconsciously knew to be true could be true that I was not alone. It laid a path for what would eventually become my own remembering and my liberation. Yes, it is a disturbing passage, 
but I, I wasn't as much disturbed by it as I was relieved and embraced. Books break the silence. They allow young people to access new ideas, adventures, experiences, and realities that reflect their own, so they know they are not alone. They know they have rights. Or they reflect experiences and ideas that are new and foreign, which open their capacity for empathy and understanding. The right wing is flaunting this very disingenuous notion that we need to ban books so our children aren't upset or made to feel guilty. What we don't think about or know or remember ultimately controls us and it dooms us to repeat it again. The process of becoming educated or awakened often involves becoming upset. But that can be the psychic alarm that connects us to collective responsibility. We live in a country with diabolical amnesia. We were finally beginning a process of recovering with our true history, a process which could radically alter our future and bring about understanding and hopefully an end to white supremacy racism, misogyny, transphobia. It is not surprising that at the height of this reckoning, the right wing would work so hard to push us back and ban books. Books are our guides. They illume and they challenge and they educate and rip off the mask. The truth may hurt for a moment, but ultimately it sets us free. Looking at the insanely long list of banned books was like looking at the underlying story, complexity, richness of this country. This extreme banning of books should alarm each and every one of us. As the Jewish poet Heinrich Hein wrote prophetically in 1822, where they burn books, they will in the end, burn human beings too. Thank you. Thank you to Marissa Tomei and V for that powerful reading and submission. Also, please give a round of applause and acknowledge our awesome ASL translator today. You've earned it. You've earned it. Jason is too cool for school. He couldn't join us. But I know, I know. No, he wanted to be here. Jason Reynolds is joining us next via video. He is a best-selling author with more than a dozen books, including Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You with Ibram Kendi, which has been censored. He's a recipient of the Newbery Honor and Pritz Honor. He's also the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Give him a round of applause, even though he's on the video screen. The most interesting and strange misconception about banned books and challenged books is that it's a new phenomenon. I know it's all the rage at the moment and that it's in the news often at this particular juncture of our lives, but the truth of the matter is that it is not a new thing. As a matter of fact, I've been challenged for the better half of 10 years, and even that is just a drop in the bucket. What we're about to see is the great legend, the master literarian, our godmother herself, Toni Morrison, speaking at an event in 1982, the year before I was even born, about this very thing, proving once more that this is perennial, uh, that it is woven into the fibers of our country, and it is an issue that has been contended and contested uh, for decades and decades and decades. Let's hear what Master Morrison has to say. Hitler burnt books and used a phrase that's very interesting when he was condemning a certain kind of art in Munich. He said, uh, we have to get rid of the um, artistic criminal. In other words, the idea of an artist as a criminal 
because of the production of his art is an idea that I never heard before and since. In other words, there could be such a thing as an illegal song or an illegal book. And you have to understand that I come from a race of people for whom at one time in this country it was illegal to be taught to read. It was illegal and punishable by physical punishment and sometimes fatal punishment to learn how to read. And white people who taught black people how to read were taking the risk of being punished. So that is more than a secular event as far as I'm concerned. And I think the same um, sensibilities that informed those people to make it a criminal act for black people to read are the uh, uh, ancestors of the same people who are making it a criminal act for their own children to read. And I don't see a great deal of difference between that. There is some hysteria associated with the idea of reading that is all out of proportion to what is, in fact, happens when one reads. Before we begin, let's get something straight. This is not a history book. I repeat, this is not a history book, at least not like the ones you're used to reading in school. The ones that feel more like a list of dates, there will be some, with an occasional war here and there, a declaration, definitely got to mention that, a constitution, that too, a court case or two, and of course, the paragraph that's read during Black History Month, Harriet Rosa Martin. This isn't that. This this isn't a history book, or at least it's not that kind of history book. Instead, what this is, is a book that contains history, a history directly connected to our lives as we live them right this minute. This is a present book, a book about the here and now, a book that hopefully will help us better understand why we are where we are as Americans, specifically as our identity pertains to race. Uh oh. The R word, which for many of us still feels rated R or can be matched only with another R word, run. But don't. Let's all just take a deep breath, inhale, hold it, exhale, and breathe out race. See, it's not so bad, except for the fact that race has been a strange and persistent poison in American history, which I'm sure you already know. I'm also sure that depending on where you are and where you've grown up, your experiences with it, or at least the moment in which you recognize it, may vary. Some may believe race isn't an issue anymore, that it's a thing of the past, old tales of bad times. Others may be certain that race is like an alligator, a dinosaur that never went extinct but instead evolved, and though hiding in murky swamp waters, that leftover monster is still deadly. And then there are those of you who know that race and more critical racism are everywhere. Those of you who see racism regularly robbing people of liberty, whether as a violent stick up or as a sly pickpocket, the thief known as racism is all around. This book, this not history history book, this present book is meant to take you on a race journey from then to now to show why we feel how we feel, why we live how we live, and why this poison, whether recognizable or unrecognizable, whether it's a scream or a whisper, just won't go away. Thank you, Jason. Next up, we invite Susan Cooklin to the stage. She's a renowned photographer and the award-winning author of more than 30 books for children and young adults that address social issues and culture, including Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out, a Stonewall Honor book, which I believe is right there, and you need to purchase that book and all other books, correct? Yes, of course. <laughs> Authors need to eat. Uh, as one censor put it, the book needed to be pulled for its, quote, effect on any young people who would read it. Susan, please affect us with your words. Thank you, good evening. 
Everybody there? Good evening. <laughs> so writing is about choices, what we put in a work and what we leave out. Now, in recent times, expletives began appearing in young adult literature to reflect the use of language in today's culture. The pushback about smutty language put numerous titles on the ALA's most challenged list. Too high? Thank you. In many cases, inappropriate language was used as a cover to condemn books that dealt with race and LGBT, LGBTQ storylines. Not anymore. With the recent right-wing attacks on the First Amendment, authors, teachers, librarians are vilified, picketed, fired, and threatened for making available inclusive literature. Now, how does that affect our future commitment to the young adult reader? Judy Bloom says, it's not just the books under fire that worry me. It's the books that will never be written. It's the books that will never be read. All due to the fear of censorship. As always, young readers will be the real losers. Now, case in point, in 2012, while I was writing Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teen Speak Out, I was worried about an opening chapter about a young, young trans woman by the name of Christina. Christina was attending her, uh, an all-boys Catholic school in the Bronx, and in her senior year, she decided, enough is enough, I'm going to be who I am. While I was working on the opening chapter about, about Christina, uh, something that happened to Christina when she was in the, uh, on the subway. There was a second screen by my desk that had a listserv of librarians talking about what are we going to do about the fucks. Well, um, they weren't exactly against the word, but they were worried about how they were going to handle it with parents and with schools, school administrations. They also worried about where it would fit in their libraries. So meanwhile, I was writing and writing, and I felt terrible for what these beloved librarians were about to confront with my future text. This is what I wrote. Christina, chapter two, every girl is different. Christina's story begins on the number two train, a subway line in New York City. It's late, about 2 a.m. Christina is a beautiful, tall, 20-year-old college student whose long hair is sometimes dyed strawberry blonde and sometimes dark brown. On this night, she and her boyfriend, Gabriel, are sitting quietly in their seats, minding their own business. Two girls across the aisle are giggling and chattering loud enough for everyone to hear. Girl number one, I don't know what that is. Girl two, yeah, what is that? Christina, are those girls talking about me? Gabriel, yeah, I think so. Christina stares at them. Girl one, hi, can I help you with something? Yeah, you can stop laughing at me. Um, this is a free country, and I can laugh at whatever I want. And how do you know I'm laughing at you? Because I'm not stupid. I heard you say I don't know what that is. Girl number one, I know you're a man with that big ass face. Christina's anger raised, rapidly taps her foot on the floor. Gabriel, her boyfriend, you know, you better learn to respect people. Girl one, I'm being respectful. I said hi, right? Gabriel, no, you're not being respectful. You're over there giggling and laughing. I can laugh at whatever I want. How about you staying out of this and keep this between us girls? Christina, Christina says, you better shut the fuck up before I fuck you up. Who's going to fuck me up? Me. Christina throws her purse on the side, jumps up, grabs girl number one by the hair, and pulls her off the seat and punches her in the face. Girl number one grabs hold of Christina's hair, but she is wearing a wig, so it comes off right in her hand. Fuck! 
girl number one throws the wig to the side, to the side and starts punching. Girl number two pulls out a can of mace. Gabrielle grabs her by the throat and throws her on the floor. By now, the train is in chaos. The other riders are trying to break everyone up and everyone is screaming. When the train reaches the next station, it screeches to a halt and Christina is thrown back on the seat. Girl number one lands a right punch to her mouth. Christina's lip starts bleeding. Girl number one then punches Christina, who is kicking, screaming, and trying hard not to cry. Eventually, the people on the train manage to break everyone up. Girl number one, yeah, yeah, you're bleeding. She prances around the train. I fucked a man up. You pussy, get off the fucking train, Christina says later. It was like I was trying not to cry, but it was really hurtful because, because thinking about that day again, one of many, People can be so nasty, so rude. I didn't do anything to her, but she had to butt into my life for no reason. I was picked on way too much to keep my mouth shut now. My mom says is very worried because my temper could get me in trouble, but I don't let people walk over me no more, not like they used to. The other day I was thinking, I really, really hate being transgender. It's a tr constant struggle. It's so annoying. While everyone else my age is saving up for a car or a house, I'm saving up to look possible. I'm saving up for a vagina. Thank you. Let's hear it for Susan and Christina. And our new ASL translator. I see you. I see you. All right. Now we have Fatima Sheikh, who's joining us to read a selection from The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Fatima is a writer and co-chair of PEN America's Children's and Young Adult Books Committee. Her most recent book, Economy Hall, The Hidden History of a Free Black Brotherhood, is the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities Selection for its 2022 Book of the Year. And she is the subject of a recent documentary, The Bengali, by director Kavri Kohl. Let's welcome Fatima Sheikh. Thank you, everyone. Um, the Hate You Give is a young adult novel about a girl named Star who is coming home from a party with a childhood friend named Khalil. They're stopped by an officer, and there is a tragedy. In 2016, a year before this book was published, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Isabel Wilkerson, wrote in the New York Times that an analysis of FBI statistics showed that an African American was killed by the police every three and a half days. The next year, The Hate You Give was published. People said it should be banned because it depicted the police in the wrong way, that they were adversaries of the black community. It also probably had a lot of words, like you, Susan, had. <laughs> but uh, other people disagreed because they said it gave uh, young people an entryway into a discussion about a real problem. So what I'm going to do is read to you from a few pages from The Hate You Give, uh, the words of Star and Angie Thomas, the author. Mama and Daddy gave me two talks. The first was The Birds and the Bees. The other talk was what, about what to do when a cop stopped me. Mama fussed and told Daddy, I was too young for that. He argued, I wasn't too young to get arrested or shot. Star, listen, Star. You do whatever they tell you to do, he said. Keep your hands visible. Don't make any sudden moves. Only speak when they speak to you. An officer stops us, parks the car, and puts his brights on. I blinked to keep from being blinded. I remember something else Daddy said. If you're with somebody, you better hope they don't have nothing on them or both of y'all going down. Kay, you don't have anything in the car, do you? He watches the cop in his side mirror. Nah. The officer approaches the driver's door, taps the window. Khalil cranks the handle to roll it down. 
As if we aren't blinded enough, the officer beams his flashlight in our faces. License, registration, and proof of insurance. Khalil breaks a rule. He doesn't do what the cop wants. What do you pull us over for? License, registration, and proof of insurance. I said, what'd you pull us over for? Khalil, I plead, do what he said. My heart pounds loudly with daddy's instructions echo in my head. Take a good look at the cop's face. If you can remember with his badge number, that's even better. With the flashlight following Khalil's hands, I make out the numbers on the badge, 115. He's white, mid-30s to early 40s, has a brown buzz cut and a thin scar over his top lip. Khalil hands the officer his papers and license. 115 looks at them. Where are you two coming from? None of you, Khalil says, meaning none of your business. What'd you pull me over for? Your taillight's broken. So you gonna give me a ticket or what? Khalil asks. You know what, get out of the car, smart guy. Man, just give me my ticket. Get out the car, hands up where I can see them. Khalil gets out with his hands up. 115 yanks him by the arm and pins him against the back door. I fight to find my voice. He didn't mean... Hands on the dashboard, the officer barks at me. Don't move. I do what he tells me, but my hands are shaking so much to be still, too much to be still. Stay here, he tells Khalil. And you, he looks in the window at me, don't move. I can't even nod. The officer walks back to his patrol car. My parents haven't raised me to fear the police, just to be smart around them. They told me it's not smart to move while a cop has his back on you. Khalil moves. He comes to the door. It's not smart to make a sudden move, Khalil does. He opens the driver's door. You okay, Star? Pa. One, Khalil's body jerks. Blood spatters from his back. He holds on to the door to keep himself upright. Pow. Two, Khalil gasps. Pow. Three, Khalil looks at me, stunned. He falls to the ground. No, 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 it's all I can say like I'm a year old and it's the only word I know. I'm not sure how I end up on the ground next to him. My mom said that if someone gets shot, you try to stop the bleeding, but there's so much blood, too much blood. No, no, no. Khalil doesn't move, he doesn't utter a word, he doesn't even look at me. His body stiffens and he's gone. I hope he sees God. It would be easy to quit if this was just about me, him, Khalil that night and that cop, but it's about way more than that. It's also about Oscar, Ayana, Trevon, Rakia, Michael, Eric, Tamir, John, Izel, Sandra, Freddie, Alton, Philandro. It's even about that little boy in 1955 who nobody recognized at first, Emmett. The messed up part, there are so many more. Another round of applause for Fatima and Angie Thomas, the hate you give. How's everyone doing so far? You guys good? I like it, I like it. All right, we've had novels, we've had nonfiction, we had music, and we're going to have music again. How about some poetry? I see you. You're waiting. All right. Paul Zielinski is going to be reading works by Ellen Hopkins. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul is the co-chair of PEN America's Children's and Young Adult Book Committee, and he's an author and an illustrator, although he leans more heavily into illustration, winning multiple awards for his work. Give a round of applause to Paul. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to read a book from a book by Ellen Hopkins. And uh, Ellen Hopkins writes novels, uh, mostly in verse, mostly for young adults, and mostly with one-word titles like Crank and Burned or Glass. And they all shine a light, a hard but sympathetic light, on the awful realities that run life off the rails <coughs> for so many people in this country. 
And so many of her books, so many of her readers report that she has saved their lives. And not surprisingly, her books, at least 12 of which have been New York Times bestsellers, uh, are also the frequent targets of right-wing book bans and challenges. And in PEN America's new index of banned books in schools, Ellen's books appear 26 times, at least as of last Friday. So I'm going to be reading from her 2019 book, People Kill People, in which the narrator is actually the human urge to violence. The text moves back and forth between short free verse poems in which violence philosophizes and longer chapters that address a scattering of troubled young people living in southern Arizona. They're poor whites, middle class whites, Mexican Americans, involved in uh, drug culture, gun culture, and in white supremacist groups. So their interconnected stories build to a climax uh, at, a, uh, at a big rally in Tucson for immigration rights with a horrific climax coming that is actually quite different from the one you think you see coming. So I'm going to read something from, it's kind of from the middle of the book. <clears throat> Closeted apparitions. Closeted apparitions fuel desperation and so are valuable assets in the game of spinning chambers. One spook is all it takes. You might not believe a person still waiting through adolescence could harbor such malevolent intent. One slight is all it takes, says violence. Age is barely even a consideration when haunted by the desire for revenge or need for self-preservation. One fragile moment is all it takes. Fewer years simply equate to shallower perspective, exacerbating youthful impulsivity. One bullet is all it takes. Hold your breath, hold your breath, but keep your eyes open. Anticipation is integral to the thrill. Approaching the summit comes a mad rush toward the apex, assumptions crumbling as the widening view reveals unforeseen territory. Was this how explorers felt, cresting the precipice to discover on the far side of the peak the promised land? You've met almost the whole cast accepting bit players, only Ashlyn left to go. She and I are well acquainted, in fact, we're very old friends. Her story is one of neglect and abuse at the hands of her father, who's currently serving 25 years to life for stabbing her mother to death, an event she unfortunately witnessed. The first decade of her life was a series of escalating rage-fueled acts early on she learned to duck and run. Having friends was impossible. You'd think at least one kid might show a little compassion for a classmate who sometimes came to school wearing bruises and muttering fabricated excuses about their source. Think again. Ashlyn's escape was books, and while tripping off into fantasy worlds offered respite from personal upheaval, she was particularly drawn to nonfiction tomes about history, tales of survival in the face of war or natural disasters, bolstered her confidence that she too might somehow make it through. She did, but her mom did not. Then came five years living with her paternal grandmother whose own death precipitated the handoff to her father's brother, Frank, and his wife, Louise. It was Uncle Frank's nephew who introduced Ashlyn to the nationalist movement she embraces. And why not? The traditionalist youth network not only accepts her, but promises to protect her, if only to maintain white purity. Finally, a place where she belongs. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Ellen. Books which deal with dystopia are often um, seen as horror movies, right? Until they become real. And I was thinking about that when I was thinking about Fahrenheit 451, 
which will be read next from our novelist, Tochi Onibuchi, who, by the way, he has two books out there. You got to buy those two books, all right? The two books that are out there are Goliath, Riot Baby, which was a finalist for the Hugo, the Nebula, the Locust, the Und it's just disgusting. It's just like every award, NAACP, New England Book Award for fiction. It's gross. I'm going to stop. It's just, we're going to be here for like like 30 years, all right? So just buy the book, all right? Right, won every award. Right, baby. Um, please give him a round of applause as he reads an excerpt from Fahrenheit 451. Tochi. The trees overhead made a great sound of letting down their dry rain. The girl stopped and looked as if she might pull back in surprise, but instead stood regarding Montag with eyes so dark and shining and alive that he felt he had said something quite wonderful. But he knew his mouth had only moved to say hello. And then when she seemed hypnotized by the salamander on his arm and the phoenix disc on his chest, he spoke again. Of course, he said, you're our new neighbor, aren't you? And you must be, she raised her eyes from his professional symbols, the fireman. Her voice trailed off. How oddly you say that. I, I'd have known it with my eyes shut, she said slowly. What, the smell of kerosene? My wife always complains. He laughed. You never wash it off completely. No, you don't, she said in awe. He felt she was walking in a circle about him, turning him end for end, shaking him quietly and emptying his pockets without once moving her head. Kerosene, he said before, because the silence had lengthened. It's nothing but perfume to me. Does it seem like that? Really? Of course. Why not? She gave herself time to think of it. I don't know. She turned to face the sidewalk going toward their homes. Do you mind if I walk back with you? I'm Clarice McClellan. Clarice, Guy Montag. Come along. What are you doing out so late wandering around? How old are you? They walked in the warm, cool, blowing night on the silvered pavement, and there was the faintest breath of fresh apricots and strawberries in the air. And he looked around and realized this was quite impossible so late in the year. There was only the girl walking with him now, her face bright as snow in the moonlight, and he knew she was working his questions around, seeking the best answers she could possibly give. Well, she said, I'm 17 and I'm crazy. My uncle says the two always go together. When people ask your age, he said, always say 17 and insane. Isn't this a nice time to go out for a walk? I like to smell things and look at things and sometimes stay up all night walking and watch the sunrise. They walked on again in silence, and finally she said thoughtfully, you know, I'm not afraid of you at all. He was surprised. Why should you be? So many people are afraid of firemen, I mean. But you're just a man, after all. He saw himself in her eyes, suspended in two shining drops of bright water, himself dark and tiny in fine detail, the lines about his mouth, everything there as if her eyes were two miraculous bits of violet amber that might capture and hold him intact. Her face turned to him now, was fragile milk crystal with a soft and constant light in it. It was not the hysterical light of electricity, but what? But the strangely comfortable 
and rare and gently flattering light of the candle. One time, as a child in a power failure, his mother had found and lit a last candle, and there had been a brief hour of rediscovery, of such illumination that space lost its vast dimensions and grew comfortably around them. And they, mother and son, alone, transformed, hoping that the power might not come on again too soon. And then Clarice McClellan said, do you mind if I ask, how long have you worked at being a fireman? Since I was 20, 10 years ago. Do you ever read any of the books you burn? He laughed, that's against the law. Oh, of course. It's fine work. You know, Monday, burn Malay, Wednesday, Whitman, Friday, Faulkner, burn them to ashes, then burn the ashes. That's our official slogan. They walked still farther, and the girl said, is it true that long ago firemen put fires out instead of going to start them? No, <laughs> houses have always been fireproof. Take my word for it. Strange. I heard once that a long time ago, houses used to burn by accident, and they needed firemen to stop the flames. He laughed. She glanced quickly over. Why are you laughing? I don't know. He started to laugh again and stopped. Why? You laugh when I haven't been funny and you answer right off. You never stop to think what I've asked you. He stopped walking. You're an odd one, he said, looking at her. Haven't you any respect? Thank you. Thank you, Tochi. Just to remind you that uh, Fahrenheit 451 was a fictional novel about a dystopia, and they're burning books in America in 2022. Molly Crabapple is here to share work from a revolutionary, evolutionary poet, Allen Ginsberg. You can, you, give him, give, you can give it applause, it's fine. No need to be shy. We give, we give love and respect to poets here. Molly is the author of Brothers of the Gun, an illustrated collaboration with Syrian war journalist Marwan Hisham, and her memoir is Drawing Blood. Her art is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the United States Library of Congress, and the New York Historical Society. Give it up for Molly. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz, who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs, illuminated, who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and Blake light tragedy among the scholars of war, who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered unshaven rooms and underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall who got busted in their pubic beards returning through Laredo with the belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine on Paradise Alley, death, or purgatoried their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock and endless balls. 
incomparable blind streets of shuddering cloud and lightning in the mind leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Peyote solidities of halls, backyard, green tree, cemetery dawns, Wine drunkenness over rooftops, storefront burrows of tea head joyride, neon blinking traffic lights, sun and moon and tree vibrations in the roaring winter dusks of Brooklyn, ash can rantings and the kind king light of the mind. Who chain themselves to subways for the endless ride from Battery to Holy Bronx on Benzedrin until the noise of the wheels and the children brought them down, shuddering, mouth-racked and battered, bleak of brain, all drained of brilliance to the drear light of zoo, who sank all night in submarine light of Bickford's, floated out and sat through the steel, Beer, the stale beer afternoon of desolate fugazis, listening to the crack of doom on that hydrogen jukebox, who talked continuously, 70 hours, from park to pad to bar to Bellevue, to the museum to the Brooklyn Bridge. A lost battalion of platonic conversationalists jumping down the stoops, off fire escapes, off windowsills, off Empire State, out of the moon. Yakety yakking, screaming, vomiting, whispering facts and memories and anecdotes and eyeball kicks and shocks of hospitals and jails and wars. Whole intellects disgorged in total recall for seven days and nights with brilliant eyes meet for the synagogue cast on the pavement, who vanished into nowhere, Zen, New Jersey, leaving a trail of ambiguous picture postcards of Atlantic City Hall, suffering Eastern sweats and Tangerian bone grindings and the migraines of China under junk withdrawal in Newark's bleak furnished room who wandered around and around at midnight in the railroad yard, wondering where to go and went, leaving no broken hearts, who lit cigarettes in boxcars, 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 racketing through snow towards lonesome farms and grandfather night, who studied Plotinus, Poe, St. John of the Croths, telepathy, and Bob Kabbalah, because the cosmos instinctively vibrated at their feet in Kansas. Who loaned it through the streets of Idaho, seeking visionary Indian angels, who were visionary Indian angels, who thought they were only mad when Baltimore gleamed in supernatural ecstasy. Who jumped in limousines with the Chinamen of Oklahoma on the impulse of winter, midnight, streetlight, small town rain who lounged hungry and lonesome through Houston, seeking sex or soup or jazz, and followed the brilliant Spaniard to converse about America and eternity, a hopeless task, and so took a ship to Africa, who disappeared into the volcanoes of Mexico, leaving behind nothing but the shadow of dungarees and the lava and ash of poetry scattered in fireplace Chicago. Who reappeared in the West Coast, investigating the FBI in their beards and shorts with their big pacifist eyes, sexy in their dark skin, passing out incomprehensible leaflets. Who burned cigarette holes in their arms, protesting the narcotic tobacco haze of capitalism who distributed super communist pamphlets in Union Square, weeping and undressing while the sirens of Los Alamos wailed them down and wailed down wall and the Staten Island Ferry also wailed. Who broke down crying in white gymnasiums, naked and trembling before the machinery of other skeletons. 
who bit detectives in the neck and shrieked with delight in police cars for committing no crime but their own wild cooking, pederasty, and intoxication. Who howled on their knees in the subway and were dragged off the roof waving genitals and manuscripts. Who let themselves be fucked in the ass by saintly motorcyclists and screamed with joy who blew and were blown by those human seraphim, the sailors, caresses of Atlantic and Caribbean love, who bawled in the morning, in the evenings, in rose gardens and the grass of public parks and cemeteries scattering their semen freely to whomever come who may, who hiccuped endlessly, trying to giggle, but wound up with a sob, behind a partition in a Turkish bath when the blonde and naked angel came to pierce them with a sword. Who lost their love boys to the three old shrews of fate, the one-eyed shrew of the heterosexual dollar, the one-eyed shrew that winks out of the womb, and the one-eyed shrew that does nothing but sit on her ass and snip the intellectual golden threads of the craftsman's loom. Howl was a poem that was under trial from the moment that it was published. They tried to ban it. It was a poem that when I was 12 years old and I read it for the first time, it opened up whole possibilities of what my life would be in, in its declaration of war on bourgeois society, its commitments to sex and drugs and art and madness and rebellion. And I loved it. I love it with every part of me. And when I think about threats to a poem like Howl, I don't merely think about the burning or the banning of books, though of course those are threats. I think about the way that the world that Ginsburg lived in, the type of cities that he wrote in, have been so sterilized and so commodified and so sucked dry of any purpose except to generate capital. And that, that crushing of spaces for bohemia, for art, for wildness, is as much of a threat to something like Howl as a book burning. Thank you. Molly Crabapple reading Ginsburg's Howl. All right, how are you all doing? We're almost there, almost to the end. We've got two authors left. I want you to give a lot of love for our next author. Tanya Talaga will be here. She is Ojibwe with roots in Fort William, First Nation, Ontario, Canada. She worked as a journalist at the Toronto Star for more than 20 years. And she's the author of Seven Fallen Feathers and All Our Relations, Finding a Path Forward. Give her a huge round of applause. Bonjour. I'm grateful to be here tonight, and I'm, uh, I'm honored to read the beginning of a book by my late friend, Lee Miracle. Lee Miracle was a Stolo author, an indigenous woman. She died on November 11th, actually. She was 71 years old. She was a matriarch, a mentor to me, and to so many other Indigenous writers in Canada. She was a mentor to Billy Ray Belcourt, to Cherie Demoline, to myself. She wrote books for Indigenous women, for our people. She wrote books about murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls before anybody did. She wrote books about residential schools, about the true history of this continent, of how we are on a continent that was formed from violence, from the extermination of my people, then slavery, and what we have now today. Lee had to petition to get her books published. People told her, we don't want to read books by Indigenous women. We don't want to read books by Indigenous people. And she wouldn't stop. She actually got a petition to get her first book published. Lee's books were also banned in Canada during various times. And so I thought I would read from one of her 
most famous books. She's written books like Raven's Song, I Am Woman, and she wrote Celia's Song. She taught me and other indigenous writers to be proud of who we are, to speak from the land. She said, if you want to know Canada, if you want to know this land, listen to the voices of indigenous women. There are, there is a different way to see the world. And this is our way. We see when we tell stories, we see forwards, we see backwards, we see now. This is Celia's song. There is something helpless in being a witness. No one comes here anymore, just me. I can't seem to resist returning to the place where everyone died. Some insane kind of illness overtook them, burned them with its heat. The monster illness disfigured them before taking their lives. It's so quiet. The longhouse is decrepit now. I stand transfixed. It looks as though a single shingle has blown off the roof during a storm, beginning the process of destruction, precipitating the damage inside. That single missing shingle allowed the rain to leak onto the woven mats covering the bones on every bench of the house, attacking the blankets in the southwest corner. The fire in the center died long ago, but the wet ashes make the inside seem forlorn. A lonely feast bowl squats near where the fire has been. The damp has spread to all corners and, over the decades, storm rains invaded and reinvaded the longhouse, tearing more and more shingles in a steady rake. The wet penetrated. Summer heat spurred the blanket's decay. The bones lie naked underneath the rotted weavings. Under these, the dead rot. Even after all this time, the smell of them co-mingles with the moldering, blanket, the moldering blankets and mats. The scent is horrific. Mold, flesh, and goat fiber rot fill the house. The bones of the dead loathe their own stench. They should not be here. I worry for the dead. Piled up in the last longhouse of this village, behind the perishing cedars just before the hill, the bones fret inside this decrepit structure. The people were here one day, then gone. Some small part of me resents their departure. They did not volunteer to leave, but I resent their departure nonetheless. Some days, I resent their absence. It creates such a desolate landscape. But today is not such a day. Still, I empathize with the petulance that simmers inside the angry bones. The intensity of their rage grows with time. The bones wait, wait for burial, wait for ceremony, for their final resting place. They shift and rattle their discontent. I breathe deep. There is not much I can do but visit and witness for them. That was before the storm broke. Miigwech. Never underestimate the power of a powerful writer. Although we might not be the most powerful or the wealthiest, we always get the last word. And the word outlives us, and as we've seen with the words of Lee Miracle, may her memory be a blessing, and may her words continue to inspire new generations of writers. All right, last one, final author. You ready? Eileen Miles. Eileen, gotta bring the A game. Poet, novelist, author of 22 books, most recently, For Now, a talk lesson about writing, they are here to read an excerpt from a New Yorker essay. 
Eileen Miles. Thank you. Hi, I'm very happy to be part of this and to be at the end of this um, festival excitement moment of literature. Um, you know, I, I you know, I wanted to kind of jump a little bit out of the box of, of um, books and and more into texts with, with definitely a mind for, for um, the forbidden. And I was very excited that, um, that Molly Apple did Allen Ginsberg, who was so great and always about the forbidden. And I, and I thought about when he went to Russia in the 80s at a certain point of his own fame and I think they were celebrating him as the sort of socialist anti-American American poet and they celebrate and he was like yeah but I'm a cocksucker and he practically got thrown out of Russia you know and he had that gift if it's like if you were going to give him this he would rock the boat he was I, I think he had that essence I think of of the madness of writing which was to, always to destabilize and to change the room that he came into and do something else and I also just wanted to yeah, let's say it for Alan, yeah. Um, and I, I guess, so I want to talk about journalism, and, um, and, and saying that, I just want to acknowledge somebody that we probably all thought about recently, who was Shireen Abu Akel, who was, who was shot in Palestine recently. Um, and she was so important to so many people inside and outside of Palestine, and she was a Palestinian-American, and she should be with us today, writing and not have fallen dead on the street. It was a nightmare. And, um, and journalists, I mean, I think journalists, you know, journalists in Russia we know are poisoned. Um, journalists in other countries can be shot in the head. And I think journalists in this country either don't exist or don't get published, you know? And I think, and I thought about that when I came to New York in the 70s, I was part of um, definitely a generation of young queers who were so excited about the New York and the Village Voice and people like Jill Johnston whose, whose memorial was right in this room. And, um, and the Village Voice represented a kind of lefty journalism that was just seemed to be thriving and seemed to be part of what New York was and did. And I, lo I did a little research today and, you know, because I was like, well, what happened to The Voice? And it was just money because each new publisher who bought it had more of a feeling that in the investigative journalism didn't sell papers. And so increasingly less of that, less of that, smaller newsroom, smaller newsroom. And that's happened in newspapers all over the place. So we wind up in a place where, I mean, I'm, I, I want to read just a few pages from um, what strikes me as a forbidden story because I live in um, the East Village of... Manhattan, and I've lived there since the 70s, and one of the joys of my life has always been East River Park. And for those of you who do or don't know it, it's a park that starts in Chinatown and goes all the way up to 14th Street, and it was built by Robert Moses in 1939 for the explicit purpose of, of making there be, well, two purposes, really. He wanted, to do F, he wanted to build FDR. I mean, that was what he really wanted to do. And he knew the way to sell it was to make a park for the poor and working class people. And so they were like, okay, sounds great. And so they built the park and it's been there. So there are 80 and 100 year old trees and the park has gone through many different um, levels of, of um, um, care and disarray and danger and renewal. Um, and part of it being that New York City is, has been mostly broke in the time that I've lived in the city. And, and so that what that means is that unlike most cities in the country, the, par the budget for the parks in New York is just insane. It's like 1% of the budget and going down if Eric Adams has his way. So that's been terrible. And, and Central Park is beautiful because it's privately funded, you know, and East River Park was not getting that. And so it, it was getting grants, but it, there was no endowment, you know, and so it was a, a beloved suffering park, you know, and, and during Hurricane Sandy, it was flooded for three hours, you know, only three hours. And then the, um, the public housing that was right across from it was flooded, about three feet of water. And it largely didn't come from the park because the park absorbed the storm water and it absorbed the river. Um, it mostly came from uptown where there was no park. And so after, when, during, after Sandy, during Obama, there was a call for... Um, 
there was a call for um, um, coastal resiliency for all over Manhattan, because as we know, Manhattan will be drowned soon, sooner or later, 50 years, 30 years, there won't be a Manhattan um, unless something happens, and probably that won't happen. Um, but, but so they, they were like, let's do something, you know, and so they, they came up with a plan, which was called the Big U, and the part of it around East River Park was, gonna, was to build like a rolling berm, and there was a little bit of shoring up the park. But mainly what needed to be protected was the neighborhood, and what that really has to do with the, is sewers, nothing to do with parks whatsoever. The sewer system has not been renewed in New York City for a very long time, so flooding was just inevitable. Um, but so there was, there was money from HUD, there was a plan, there was money from HUD, there was money from the city. This is around 2018. And suddenly, um, de Blasio has a great idea. He said, we have a new, better, faster plan, and it'll protect the park and the neighborhood by destroying the park. And it was like, why is that a good idea? And the idea was to basically take out every single bit of biodiversity in the neighborhood, 1,000 trees, taking all these trees out and covering it with landfill, covering that with concrete, and then building another park, which was largely AstroTurf, on top. And that's what, and that cost, instead of like $73 million, it cost, now it's going closer to $2 billion. The city is broke. Where is this money come, coming from? Real estate. There's no other reason for why this would happen. And so the neighborhood was deeply against it. There was outrage. People were going crazy. There was a, um, there was a, um, a, a, a city council meeting. 90% of the testimony was against it. Um, environmentalists came and said, no, don't do this, don't do this. Our own city councilor, um, Carlina Rivera, who grew up in the neighborhood, was against it. And suddenly she changed her mind, and the city council said, let's do it. And so that was 2019, and you know, we've been fighting it ever since. But right now, um, 700 of those 1,000 trees are already gone. And I'm talking about 80-year-old trees, 120-year-old trees, giant, beautiful London plains. And I happen to be present for um, the cherry trees in bloom being cut, you know, just a few weeks ago. Um, and why I'm talking about this is you probably have not heard about this. It's, it's because the only way that it's called, es the plan is called Esker. The original plan was called Esker, and they simply did a brilliant journalist thing, which is to keep the name and make the plan be different, you know? And so um, Esker is, is, you know, like Esker is happening, you know? And, and it's, the only way it's ever talked about in the media is that this is the climate resiliency plan that New York City really needs. Because there's a real estate company called HRNA that is all through the city planning program. I mean, like all of the real estate in New York City is, I mean, like, is, is controlled by one company that just happens to be all the hires. There's a PR firm called McKinney who's telling all the stories, and this is all going to all the media outlets. And so I, you know, I, I'm a writer. I write, you know, I write poetry, I write novels, I write about art. But, you know, I thought, surely, I've got a reputation, surely I can write some stuff. So I've written op-ed pieces for the Times, and they're like, mm, mm it's local, it's local. You know, you know, how is the biggest city in our country local? You know, and meanwhile, I've seen so many pieces in the Times that talk about, like, hey, we just figured out that, do you understand that, like, in poor neighborhoods, there's less green space? Like, that's an amazing story. Or the stories about Meyer Lenz, you know, dying trees and, and, um, and Madison Park. There's so many ways that trees are talked about in the New York Times. Um, I wrote a piece for Harper's, and at the end, I talked about a dance party that was at the, at the amphitheater, which is now gone, um, in East River Park. Um, and they published the piece, but they took out the part about the park. Um, and then I, I mean, I, I, you know, I just sit here and gripe as a journalist about all the pieces that I thought, why is this, this is such a big story, but nobody wants to run it, and there's absolutely nobody covering it. So, so I, what I wanted to do is read some of my outtakes, you know, because um, right now, you will never hear about the fact that trees are being killed. I mean, how is this not the hugest story in New York City? Because a, a park, a 57-acre park, has never been destroyed in a major city before in this country. That's absolutely never happened. This should, at the very least, videos of what it looks like to see a park be destroyed. You know, because we're all down there. We're putting it on, we're putting it on, um, you know, social media, and even time out, right before they started chopping the trees. And also, it was illegal. We got two restraining orders, and they just went right through it. Or last summer, Scott Stringer, who was 
maybe the last honest man in New York politics, um, he, he received the contract because nobody wanted to do the job either. That was really weird. Nobody bought, nobody bought this job. There were no contractors vying for it. You just knew that this job stinks. There's something very wrong with this. Um, and finally, some bogus company came together and, and that really didn't fulfill the requirements of the city's contracts. And they gave this contract to Scott Stringer and he looked at it and he says, this contract is completely incomplete and it's incorrect and we can't, this can't, this can't go, this can't be. He sent it back to the DDC and de Blasio in his final days, because he had clearly made a deal, said, no, I'm ready, it's going to happen and he just pushed it through. I mean, there have been so many moments where you think, isn't there a legal case here? Could some, couldn't somebody stop or, or do, you know, like, no, you know, nothing happened and none of these things were, like I wrote one piece for Art Forum. Art Forum, let me write a piece. I was like, how is that Art Forum is the only place in New York City that will we'll talk about the destruct? Well, because people went to the dance parties, you know? It was like, they, they were like, oh yeah, that, you know, I was down there. So here, finally, the New Yorker, so this is the end of it, and I'll write, read a couple pages. So finally, the New Yorker, um, who I, a few years ago, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Thoreau, and he wrote a great book called Cape Cod, in which he walks from, you know, like, he walks from um, Nauset to Provincetown. He did it a number of times in the 19th century, and, and I've, I'm, I've taken that walk. It's a beautiful walk. And so I pitched to the New Yorker a few years ago, let me write the Thoreau walk, and they were like, meh, meh, you know, we won't get you a contract, but maybe. So last fall, when I was very excited about writing about the park, and I kept going to the New York, I mean, they published my poems. I thought, you know me. And I was like, come on, come on, you know, like, let me write about the park. And they were like, eh, you know. Um, and they said, but we'll take that Cape Cod piece. And I said, oh, okay, great, bait and switch. So, and I, and I was just too worked up because it was very close to them starting to cut the trees. I was like, I can't do that right now. So a few months ago, they, were, they said, spring, let's write, about, let's write about Cape Cod now. And I was like, okay. And so I did it. I went down in April to Cape Cod and I walked their 30 miles back and forth. And, um, and I got almost to the end of it and I thought, I mean, if, I don't know if you guys know this book, Cape Cod, but it begins with something really amazing, which is in the 19th century, a, a famine ship from Ireland was coming to Massachusetts, and it crashed on some rocks, and, um, and, and, and there was an incredible number of bodies of Irish immigrants all over the beach in Cohasset, and people from all over Boston were coming to claim their families, um, their, their families who didn't make it here. And, um, and so Thoreau opened Cape Cod with the scene of this devastation. So my thought was like, okay, I'm going to write about Cape Cod, but I'm going to write about the park. That'll be my devastation. You know, so I went to Cape Cod, I did the walk and everything. And just before the end, I thought, no, I'm going to come back and watch them cutting down the trees, you know, and I'm going to make the piece end with that. So I did that. So, um, and, um, and they killed it. So I'm just going to read. Um, they, they said, they said, I mean, they said things about my writing style, but then finally they would say, we just don't really like where it goes. Because what I did, I, I tried to pull the bait and switch on them, and I thought, okay, I'll give you Cape Cod, but I'm going to end it up with a park. And they were like, oh yeah? Oh yeah, poet? So I got to the park, I got to the park, and then, so... And, the only, and I do mention something called Falk here, and some of you guys probably find out it's Work Center, so when you hear Falk, I'm not saying fuck, I'm saying Falk. Um, so Thoreau began Cape Cod with a disaster, and I want to end mine with trees. Actually, I brought a whole slew of these um, forbidden texts, but this is the only one because we, I've already talked quite a bit. Um, Thoreau began Cape Cod with a disaster, and I want to end mine with trees. New York City's ill-considered flood plan, Esker, claims to protect the neighborhood of the Lower East Side. Now I'm repeating myself, but beautifully, but in print. Uh, of the neighborhoods of the Lower East Side and the East Village from climate change and flooding by demolishing 80-year-old East River Park, which was the only thing that protected the neighborhood during Sandy. The plan, which has already destroyed 500 trees, has arrived at an area of the park known as Corlears Hook. And you should know that Corlears Hook was also the site of um, 100 Lenape being killed by the Dutch governor in 1643. So there's a history to this location of this land being stolen. Known as Corlears Hook, specifically Cherry Street in Jackson, named Cherry because there have been cherry trees there for 400 years. And the week I returned from Cape Cod, the cherry trees were in bloom. 
Also, the New York City Parks Department, if, when the cherry trees were in bloom, were posting, the cherry trees are in bloom, the cherry trees are in bloom, pictures from all over New York City while they were cutting our cherry trees. A small group of activists, maybe 10 of us, were down there Saturday morning when the workers raised their chainsaws. Two of our numbers, Reverend Billy of the Stop Shopping Choir and Silva, swiftly entered the fenced-in area with intentions of stopping the work. They wrapped their arms around the cherry trees and were swiftly removed by the police. I was ready to get arrested too that day and jostled around hoping to make my feelings known, but the cops were not open to my plan. And after a little bit, most of them left and we left. It's New York. I had things to do. On Monday, we knew that they would go at the cherry trees in earnest. I was down there at 7, and Laura, a trumpeter and activist, was my only cohort. I was ready for jail, but I wanted to do it with somebody. But like my Cape Cod trip, that was not the direction things would take. More people showed up within the hour, and an arborist inside the fence with a blue hard hat was present. This is the man who signs a death certificate for trees in New York. Can you believe that, that somebody is an arborist who studied environment and what they wind up doing in New York City for probably a six-figure salary is killing trees? I'll share a copy. These are healthy trees, so he has to make a certificate to create an impression that his actions are meaningful and legal. That's government. The workers moved first towards a small magnolia tree, and with a few taps of a straw, the little tree came down. The workers were methodical. They would cut a tree, and then they would heave it into the chopper, and it would become mulch. A couple of small trees were removed that way, and he turned to a large one, a London plain. These are tall trees overlooking FDR. They clean the air for local residents, in one case, for 120 years. And it's, so it's not, we know this, it's not just the Amazon that's cleaning the air, right? New York City's air is being cleaned by, there are five million, Benjamin Sweat said this at an earlier panel, there's five million trees in New York City. So now there's like 1,000 less. And that means something in terms of how we breathe. And as you know, trees created the condition of air. We couldn't breathe if there weren't trees first on the planet. So as they are, their demise means our demise. They cleaned the air for local residents, in one case, for 120 years. I don't know if they knew in 1939 that building a park next to FDR would purify the air of carbon monoxide. They did know by the 18th century that deforestation made things hotter. But they don't seem to know that in New York City anymore. The workers went up, and also this is, this is a, the Lower East Side is, is an asthma neighborhood, one of the highest rates of asthma in New York City, and part of it is Con Ed. And part of the reason why they preferred this new plan was that they, supposedly they didn't have to move the Con Ed lines. And also, they didn't have to stop a lane of FDR. So these are the really important things as opposed to people and breathing. But they don't seem to know that anymore here. The worker went up in a white cart attached to a crane and began lopping off the upper branches of the, of the London plane. When he had made short shrift of that, he attacked its body. Clunk. If you've ever heard a tree die, you know it's a sequence of different sounds, each revealing the weight and the age of that part of the tree. The trunk is its life. Now the torso of that London plane is a strange fat toothpick bisected at the top and still for now standing sentinel over FDR. The cherry trees are in bloom all over New York today and quite dramatically on Cherry Street. I said to myself and aloud, if he goes to the cherry trees, I'm going in. The way, the way things are situated, there's a tall chain-link fence in front of us, which went up as the first indication that work would begin. The workers and the trees are inside. There's a phalanx of cops, maybe 10. The activists and cops are by now about an equal number. FDR is to my left, and the river beyond that. The rest of the park, already a disaster zone, runs along the river where the park once was, where the amphitheater was and many tall old trees. Parallel to FDR, on this side is a low concrete divide, so you can throw your leg over it and easily swing your foot to the other side of the fence to the trees. The worker raised his chainsaw and I yelled, I'm going in! It went fast. I was on the other side in a flash, and two cops were right behind me. The worker, this red-headed bearded guy, who has on several occasions bowed towards us with a grin after killing certain trees. He even said, happy Earth Day, during Earth Day when he was killing trees. 
with a grin after killing certain trees, backed off. He stopped as soon as I approached him, running. The vibe from the workers' team is that this is all a big joke and we are pathetic. And we are, in the rich, emotive sense. I get to the tree and I throw my arms around it, Joan of Arc style. Probably not the most effective position, but definitely the most dramatic. In the footage and photographs of this action, I look fat. It was cold. I had on several layers under my jacket. The two cops tried to pry me off the tree. They were successful. It was a struggle, but I was led back to the fence, which now was open when the fence was shut, and they let me go. What? I was not being arrested? I could hear the buzzing of the trees behind my back. I thought, what do I do now? Give up? That was that. I'm going back, I yelled, and I ran to the divide once again. With that, they put handcuffs on me and deposited me in a police car, and I was driven downtown to the 7th Precinct. I mean, Thoreau did this. I mean, the New Yorker sort of liked this, right? I was driven downtown to the 7th Precinct. Was it downtown? It was over there. I was kept for seven hours, pointlessly. My crime was trespassing, and they are throwing all our cases out as soon as we get to court, but they are happy to inconvenience us as much as possible. Still, they held me, in pretty, they held me pretty long, more than anyone else except Alice and Allie Ryan in December at the start of the tree slaughter. My friends brought me a, sh a sandwich, and I ate some, and I fed it to the ants. There was a dark halo around a piece of cheese on the floor. I wondered if it had been a mitzvah or a trap. The people at Falk had been encouraging me to stay on Cape Cod so I could walk the breakwater to Long Point on a sunny day in order to complete my trip, even to see the whale skeleton that had been decomposing for months. I said, no, not now, but I will do it in June, like Thoreau did, and see what's left. Thank you. Thank you. Praise. Eileen Miles. All right. That's it. Give yourself a round of applause for coming on a Saturday night to celebrate words. Remember this, if you aren't telling your story, your story is being told to you in America. And everyone says, oh, oh, we have to remember these books. Oh, there should be a roomie. Oh, why isn't there a roomie today? And I always say, like, I want the roomie of New York City. Where is the roomie of New York City? Where are the writers today? And so if anything, if anything, as we've celebrated these authors and these works that have inspired us, I hope that you are inspired to pick up the pen and write your story. Take up the space, take up the page. As they're trying to erase us, we will live loudly on the page. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Penn. Thank you to Judson. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the writers, the authors, the speakers. Thank you to the translators. And thank you to everyone at home. And remember, Buy the books. They're right there. Buy every single one. I'm watching. And everyone, if you would like to stay and join us for one more song, we do have one more song, I believe. Thank you. Wait, wait, give me a... We have a party, after party at Alphabet Lounge on 11th Street. And to bring things full circle, I got you. We have a song by, again, My Koi and Mark McKelly. Give them a round of applause. Thank you again. Thanks for staying for me. <laughs> I'm a Vietnamese singer-songwriter, and uh, I have been banned from performing in public in my own country. So today I'm very happy to perform for you all. I will perform a song called Just Be Patient. That is one of the songs in Bad Activist Performance, an autobiographical musical performance project that I'm doing now. Um, in 2016, I have met with President Obama in the meeting with Vietnamese civil society representatives in Hanoi. And in the meeting, we talk about Vietnamese human rights situations. And at the end of the meeting, Obama told me, just be patient. That inspired me to write this song. Be 
Before you came, I dreamt of you. You with your power to make wrongs right. For you, I put myself on the line. For you, I was prepared to do time. On our hour, ghosts and demons, serpents, snakes, and deadly creatures wanna catch me, kill me, burn me. were the hope of my life You once were the hope of my life I saw your halo shining bright Then you gave me some advice Just be patient Just be Patient, 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 just be patient. You once were the hope of my life. Now I'm hopeless. Mark McKelly. Thank you very much. Thank you.